All right, let's do it. I'm recording. Sweet. Tom Ballard, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us on the weekend briefing. Thanks, Tom. Lovely to talk to you. Lovely to see you. So this is a wild time of year for you. It's basically comedy festival Christmas. You've just been at the Adelaide Fringe uh, doing a show with Michael Hing. You're about to do four weeks of shows at Melbourne Comedy Festival and then some other dates, including Brisbane. So what's this time of year like for you? What headspace are you in right now? It is a it is a wild and crazy time. I reckon my comedy festival show jokes, what I'm doing is is almost a constant presence in my brain to the point of to the detriment of almost every other facet of my life. This is often a period of the year when I'll be putting on weight. I won't be going to the gym. <laughs> I'll be sleeping terribly, and I'll be procrastinating. I should be working on my show, right? Going over the script. I'll be worried about doing that, but I won't actually sitting be sitting down to do that because I'll find a million other things to distract myself, mainly clipping up um, clips of me doing stand-up comedy to promote the show that I should be working on. So it's a, it's a vicious, vicious cycle. But yeah, it's all building up to the Melbourne Comedy Festival, which is, you know, Comedy Christmas, kind of the peak of the, of the Australian comedy year. And... I, I actually, I'm actually in a pretty good space right now. I just did, yeah, did those shows in Adelaide, did two shows in Tasmania and have learned that I've actually written way more than an hour of stuff that I think is fairly decent. And so now the job is to actually focus the show, cut the shit, fix the problems of the bits that I worry about doing and hopefully make it into a cohesive hour that is both hopefully very, very funny, but also trying to say the thing that I really want to say. So to sum it up in a word, um, stressful? That's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it it is well. I'm I'm much less stressed than I was in January. I was like, oh, I don't I don't think I have a show. How? What if I? What if we get to April, and they say, hey everyone, welcome to the stage, Tom Ballard, and I walk out there and go, sorry guys, I got nothing for you this year. Bye bye. I'll give you all <laughs> refunds. I mean, these are even though you've done it so many times. This is my 14th time, I think, doing a show for the Melbourne Comedy Festival. Wow. Even though it happens every single year, and it all works out exactly the same. That is, you think you don't have a show, then you pull it together and you're able to get through it. Every year you think, yeah, maybe this is the year in which I actually have nothing of substance or quality to say. Hmm. And so now I'm like, yeah, I have a, I have a spoiler stuff to, to, to choose from. I still need to pull my finger out and do the actual work. But I actually think, yeah, um, Melbourne is going to be super fun. Yeah, but I mean, it's interesting to hear you say you worry about running out of material. I can't ever see that happening with you because your, your comedy is often about the world um, and... Unlike a lot of other comedians, you will go straight into politics. Um, you will just, you know, smash it on the head. Um, and, you know, it's not always political. I mean, you did a great piece about not being allowed to go horse riding because you went over the weight limit. You do hit the personal <laughs> stuff too, but you you do. <laughs> that was good, by the way. Um, but Thanks. you you go straight in on politics and there's always so much to talk about. Uh, you You seem to be perennially angry about something political so there's a deep mind there for you isn't there no that's true thankfully uh politicians in the world continue to be fucked idiots that i can make fun of there's a lot of things to be angry about and anger is sort of a good starting point for comedy often when you're like oh there's something wrong with the world and so chances are there's some nugget in there that's that's gonna get me animated enough to write some jokes about it so that's certainly true this show, I'm certainly reflecting on the voice referendum result. That's a really big part of the show about how angry and depressed that made me and hopefully getting a few jokes out of uh, the ridiculousness of that situation. But there is also a, about a 10-minute routine about the fact that I stand up to wipe my ass. So there really is something for everyone. And I suppose the world <laughs> and my life does keep providing material. Oh, wow. Um, that's heavy. The concern, I suppose, is that whether I have anything original to say or fun to say mm. or stuff that hasn't already been said or stuff that's going to be a little bit boring. To, to say something new and original that does feel true and feel like something that people haven't heard before, that's that's the great challenge. I okay, yeah, that is, a, I guess, a difficult sweet spot because, um, yeah, uh, you can get up and just bore people to tears with your politics, um, but you're obviously, there is a bit of a perfect... <laughs> And I do. <laughs> and you, I mean, you did it. You did a show that was called like the, the lecture or something, didn't you? Several years ago, where you just just went hell for leather on like um, asylum seeker policy. So you <laughs> you will do it, but there, I imagine there there is a sweet. What is the sweet spot for you? Yeah, I mean, the, the sweet spot, and I can feel it. And there are certain routines that I have in my in my uh, repertoire that I've done before in which I feel like I'm both being really as funny as I can be and also saying something that I really 
think, or I'm saying, pointing something out that is like genuinely funny and says something about my, my, my politics. I mean, I could not to be an asshole to, be, to reflect on my <laughs> favorite routines, but I did have a routine in which I was sort of making the point about how rich the political class is, how my friend went to a grilled restaurant in Tony Abbott's electric electorate and saw that the that grilled was raising money to get new uniforms for the local rowing team. All right. Hmm. Like just to illustrate the hmm. the the wealth disparity in this country and the fact that that's where Tony Abbott comes from. And of course the big punchline is like, come on, rowing people don't need money. Uh, they're the they're rich, they're privately educated, they want lower taxes for rich, they hate the environment. They're the boat people we should be worried about. Okay. Hmm. And that to me was like a line that would always get a satisfying laugh because I was, I think, being very funny about an issue, but also saying something in a very satisfying way about about Australian politics. Um, that's the sweet spot for me when you're actually landing something like with a really big laugh and also, you know, really keying into something that I've felt for a very long time and I think other people really feel. That's that's the uh, that's the golden moment. That's what you're always shooting for. Yeah, and so a lot of a lot of Aussie comedy doesn't seem to go into this space. I think there's a bigger tradition of um, political comedy, certainly in America, um, probably in Britain as well, but less so here. I, I feel like you know you're one of the standouts in that space, and I think you know it does. It needs conviction, like it it does sort of need anger, and some of it needs to be real. But I wonder, you know, if it was so real that it was all you cared about, you'd actually go out and be fixing the world rather than just joking about <laughs> the world. So I want to explore in this conversation. Oh, God, I'm so exposed. Tom <laughs> Tilly, you've, you've exposed me as the fraud I am, you asshole. <laughs> We've still got half an hour to go. Um, we should have saved that for the end. But what... <laughs> what does drive you? What? Why do you want to head into this space? Is it more than just entertainment? Sincerely, like it's such a great point, and I've often had this thought to myself: like, okay, Tom, if you really care this much about this politics, why are you telling dick jokes to strangers <laughs> and profiting basically off talking about these issues? Why is that the case? And look, and I have comedian, some comedian friends, people like Josie Long, Mark Thomas in the UK. You know, Rod Quantock has a history of this here too often comedians who walk the walk, who are like doing, you know, doing lots of political activism while also talking about politics on stage. And then you've got someone like Corinne Grant, okay, who just quit comedy to train as a lawyer to help people with their, mm. um, you know, work claims. Like she's like, I'm just, I'm sick of doing jokes about the stuff I care about. Mm. It's not making a difference. I'm going to get out there and and be involved. Or, you know, Al Franken in the US, the, the senator who, uh, the former SNL writer who then eventually runs and becomes a... Um, a congressman, for example, and I have a huge amount of respect for those people. I have no great answer to this other than I just, I, I love performing. It's what I really love doing. I love being creative. If communication is my one sort of serious skill set, I guess I'm trying to use that as an artist and also hopefully as a bit of an activist to try and talk about stuff that matters to me. And I just don't think I'd actually be that that good at being a politician or <laughs> or um, a serious human rights lawyer or whatever. I did study law for about six weeks and dropped out to literally tell <laughs> jokes about my dick. So I guess that's just where my soul has always ended up. Um, and and I really, you know, I it might not always seem like it, but I do primarily think of myself as a, as a comedian, right? I'm a comedian. Mm -hmm. I love making people laugh. I love creating stuff. I love writing. I love performing. While I am doing that, I like talking about stuff that I really care about, and I happen to be just a politically engaged person. and And I suppose also the comedians and artists that I really love are the ones who are able to create cool art that either makes you laugh or cry, <clears throat> while saying something about the state of the world. and And mm. I've learnt so much and grown a lot as a person by listening to comedy albums, or reading books, or seeing plays, or watching TV shows by artists that I love, uh, particularly when their politics sort of align with mine and they sort of give me a deeper understanding or appreciation for what a left-wing political perspective is, is all about, you know. Um, you know, the songs of like Billy Bragg or Grace Petrie or, or what have you, these kind of songs that light a fire in, within you as a human being, I do think they have real value and can actually help build solidarity in a, in a broader progressive movement. But I'm also very aware of the fact that, yeah, my jokes aren't going to really change the world necessarily, but they're fun to do and hopefully bring some joy and comfort to some others. Yeah, Yeah. well, maybe. You never know. I mean, 
you've done Melbourne Comedy Festival 12 times, but there's many more to come. <laughs> Who knows what impact um, they might have. Um, tell us about the fire of Tom Ballard and take us, take us back a little bit into growing up in Warrnambool, what your childhood was like. Was, was there a fire lit for you? Was it about being gay in a country town and the way you were made, made to feel? Or was it something else? You know, if, if there is a real fire underneath this performance, what is it and how did it start? Yes, this moral righteousness and self-importance. Um, it is it is certainly being queer. I think that's certainly... <laughs> must it. come from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it is from being... Yes, being queer was certainly a big part of it. Being uh, an abomination in the eyes of God and doing Satan's bidding, that was certainly a radicalizing experience, <laughs> right? Now, now, look, I grew up in a progressive household. My parents are both members of their union. They were in Amnesty International. They would have been traditional Labour voters who probably post-Tamper, I think, started... Um, getting pretty disgusted with how Labor, the Labor Party had given up on its principles and was throwing refugees under the bus, so they were passionate about that. So that was always an example that was around around as, as I was growing up. So I think it was always a default that I was going to be on the left side of things, um, probably as a, as a bleeding heart liberal, which I was for a very long time, small L liberal that is. Um, and then, yes, realizing that I was gay, looking around the world, looking at around these religious homophobes and bigots who purported to be about love and caring and compassion, but were also very dedicated to denying people like me the right to have, well, be equal before the law or to just be treated as human beings was always, always really got my goat. Mm. So that, that was a pretty radicalizing experience. I come out when I'm 18 in, in Warnable um, and have, you know, for all the anxiety and freaking out about it was overwhelmingly accepted with love and kindness for my friends and family, which I'm eternally grateful for. And then I think, I reckon in my early 20s, there's a big atheism phase in there, I think, which starts with, you know, questioning things when you're a, a queer person looking at all this religious bigotry, but really got into Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and, and their kind of politics. You know, and this is also, of course, also taking place with the war on terror kind of raging on. And then I reckon for about a decade, I was just a guy who just, yeah, thought that everyone should be nicer to each other. You know, refugee rights was a, a cause that was really close to my heart and, um yeah, you know, yeah, would eventually go on to write that show in, in 2016, Boundless Plains to Share, and tried to be involved and active and constantly, I guess, constantly going through this, um, this question, right? I want to help. I want to help people. I should be making the world a better place, but I'm also desperate for attention. and want to be an actor and a famous comedian. And uh, could they ever go together, really? <laughs> um, and then 2016, when Trump gets elected... Brexit happens, Pauline Hanson comes back, I start to sort of lose my mind and start to ask some bigger questions about politics, about who this Bernie Sanders guy was, what, he, what is capitalism? I feel like people talk about capitalism, but I don't actually know what it is or what the alternative is or the history of all that. And I think from since 2016, I've been on a very long journey to end up as a, yes, bleeding heart socialist and someone who's involved with the Greens and someone who's pretty... Uh, pretty invested in class politics and who thinks the whole the whole goddamn system sucks. And I think I have a much better understanding about political history and, and class struggle and how all that sort of played out, particularly over the, the 20th century and, and how the roots of all this stuff that's shit now in this you know neoliberal status quo that we have have its roots in, in stuff that happened uh, last century. I think I'm getting my head around that. I tried to write a, write a book about it. And now I'm trying to do comedy about it that's vaguely accessible. That's the dream. Okay. That's such an... In I, I love that journey you've just taken us on from growing up in a raving lefty household to <laughs> just slowly but surely <laughs> becoming really out and proud uh, and outrageous in, in your left-wing politics. But what's, I guess, interesting for, for, for me as someone who met you in your Triple J years and, you know, both of us had our sort of... Um, professional profiles really, really elevated through our times at, at Triple J was that we were at the ABC um, where, you know, we were sort of bound to be relatively impartial as best we could. And so that's, that was easier for me. I'm naturally more of a centrist. Um, mm. But for you, that would have been quite, quite a different experience and must have been a bit of, in some ways it, it it elevated you, but that that political part of it must have been a bit challenging and a bit of a curveball in a way for for you not to kind of to be finally having this stage, but not to be able to express these deeper values that were so important to you or expressing them in cheeky ways. 
Cheeky little ways. Yeah, interesting. I mean, <laughs> when we were doing the breakfast show on Triple J, our show was not particularly political. And, and, and I would say that I still wasn't as politically engaged or at least didn't view my comedy as the as the best way for me to express my politics, I, I suppose. Um, you know, my comedy still at that point from 2010 to, yeah, 2014, 15, 16 is still quite personal based, telling stories from my life, observational, mainly sex stuff, mainly dating stuff, matters of the heart, quite personal. And then eventually I run out of all those personal stories and start, start mining my political opinions for comedy material. So... Um, we did, you know, we interviewed, we interviewed Julie Gillard on, on the, uh, on the show. We had a few, we, I think we had Malcolm Turnbull on. It was, um, it was that guy, who's that really, Wyatt Roy, that super young guy who was mm. elected as a liberal MP for Longman and it was his 21st birthday. And we thought, oh, this will be fun. We're a youth radio station. We'll celebrate this young liberal, a, a liberal federal MP is having his 21st. That'll be funny. And we had Turnbull on to wish him a happy birthday. It was the most boring segment of <laughs> in history. It was a real, real mistake. But that's that's how we came at at politics through the show. So we we were never we were never really going in hard necessarily. I mean, I guess you know the gay marriage debate was always bubbling away in the background. Mm. The chaos of the Rudd Gillard years was happening at the same time as well. And I think you could pretty, no matter your politics, you could pretty much go through that period being like, this all sucks. Uh, this <laughs> We don't seem to be talking about issues or policy at all. Mm. It's just the political class. The Labour Party is hopeless. Tony Abbott's an asshole. Um, God, don't they all suck? And I think that's probably the, the general political outlook I would have had. Now, when you get to Tonightly, the show I hosted mm. in like 2018, which was a TV show, comedy show, this is when things got a lot more spicy, where my politics was certainly much more advanced. And I think the things we were trying to say with that show certainly got us into a lot more trouble than we ever did at, at Triple J. Yes, that's what, that's where I was going to go to. I guess you were, you were further along in that political journey, but your professional life, um, which was still very media focused, still, you know, working in, on TV and radio was still within the bounds of the ABC <laughs> and the show tonightly. Um, wow. Wasn't, I mean, just, let's just look back at that for the moment, for a moment. That was, it was pretty out there. It was pretty wild. You, you were just slamming the liberals on ABC TV. <laughs> hey, we hated the Labour Party as well for, from the left, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We tried to, yeah, look, I mean, it's, the, the idea that you could have a comedy show on the ABC that is politically neutral or that any comedy can exist, any satirical comedy can exist that's, that's neutral or that doesn't have a point of view or doesn't have a base of values or a worldview at its heart, which mm. it's critiquing the status quo from, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know how you have um, satire mm. that doesn't say... This is funny because this person is doing something bad and we think this person does something bad because here's what we all agree on. Like, we should be nice. We shouldn't, we shouldn't torture refugees. Climate change is bad. Like, just some basic presuppositions that, that form the basis of, of a comedy show and a point of view. But yeah, we, were, we, were lit we wanted to get attention. We wanted to be cheeky. We wanted to, you know, shake things up a little bit. And I think that's exactly the role the ABC should play. And of course, all the boomers, the conservative boomers who hated us, we're like, oh, this isn't funny. Take us back to the days of Auntie Jack or, uh, you know, I don't know, even the older Chaser stuff or whatever. All these shows that, you know, are now looked back very fondly, but of course at the time were highly controversial and everybody hated them and stuff. And and the government, I don't know, if you're doing an AV, a comedy show, the government probably shouldn't like you very much. That's because you, you're in power and, uh, mm. and you're, they are, it's the definition of punching up. We should be ripping the piss out of you. And, um, there's something a bit odd, I reckon, if the Prime Minister's like, oh, I love that political satire show. I think that's that's a real winner. <laughs> I think, feel like maybe the show isn't saying too much, if that's the case. So, you know, given, you know, the podcast you're doing now is like the, it's called Serious Danger and it's sort of just out and out, you know, hilarious. Um, you almost sending yourself up as it being Green's propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> you mostly interview Greens. It's just so out, out and proud, um, left and green supporting. So how do you look back on those times where you were sort of even in vain trying to uh, carry out your career under this sort of impartiality banner? Does it look like an absurdity? 
Yeah, it, it it does. I mean, I don't know whether we ever defended things from to, from Tonightly, sort of saying. Um, I mean, we had jokes, we had sketches about the Greens as well, and and I and I I, I do appreciate to a, to a point a satirist who says you know you should make fun of everybody. That is, if the Greens did something stupid and funny while we were on air on Tonightly, we shouldn't say oh let's not do a joke about that because we want people to like the Greens. That would be that would mm. be um, failing in your job as a as a comedian or as a satirist while you're doing that show, and that probably would breach. ABC editorials. If it came out that tonightly it spiked a sketch for because <laughs> we didn't want to um, uh, send up the greens. Not that anyone was watching tonightly, by the way, so we had no power at all. <laughs> so so that, we should keep that in mind as well. But but certainly, you know, if you set up a comedy show made up of a whole bunch of young comedians in Australia, obviously that sketch show is going to have. Um, uh, a, a progressive young people are progressive to be actually mm. be representative of what young Australians think about stuff. You need to be more progressive. You need to take a progressive bent on stuff. And that is also what we sincerely felt. And our show should be an expression of what we and our writers and my sensibility actually think about issues. So, um, so, so I think that we, I, mean, I think we did a pretty good job in that respect. And of course, we constantly made fun of the liberals because the liberals were in government. Mm. Um, it would be really interesting to see, you know, under a Labor government, how that kind of changes and what what that would look like. Um, but yes, having left the ABC in sort of full-time capacity, I'm, I'm sort of much more free to be able to say, look, I'm a member of the Greens. I joined in 2020 in the chaos of the pandemic years, and we set up Serious Danger, this podcast, to be an explicitly partisan podcast, right? We're not an official Greens Party mm. podcast. We want to make that clear. <laughs> <laughs> the party still definitely wants some distance between some of us, the things we say, and sometimes we criticize what we think the Greens are doing. But basically, we're like, look, you look around Australian politics, we believe this stuff, we have this politics, we believe at the moment that the Greens political party, as Anthony Albanese likes to call it, is is the best vehicle for serious political change. And there are some, a bunch of things about what the Greens are and how they work that make them different to the major parties. And I think um, supporting them is, is good and they say good things. And being able to say that openly and own that and then also you know make a few jokes about the Greens as they do along the way... But also just being open about that, I think, is, is certainly much more freeing. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, is it is it a real relief just to be able to, I mean, essentially, you know, talking about political issues, freedom of speech, for you to just speak freely about what you believe in and not sort of have to dance around any of these sort of ideas of impartiality or not, or not wearing your colours. I think that'd be a lot better. And I mean, you know, there are organizations like Navarra Media in the UK, which are an explicitly leftist media project that was set up around uh, the Corbyn movement, right? So they're all left-wing people who host the show. They come at everything from a left-wing perspective, but they are still journalists. And they sort of say clearly, you know, look, this is our worldview. This is our analysis of the world. Uh, we're, we're broadly, you know, socialists or certainly anti-capitalists, but we will talk to lots of different people. And they do generally have a, a wide variety of guests on the show, they, you know, openly question things, talk through things. Like, you know, they have a they're a media outlet that has a lot of credibility, I think, even though they're explicitly, you know, upfront about their politics and their worldview. And I think it's certainly possible to do that. I, I would agree with some of the critiques of the ABC that just says, you know, you should have more conservative voices on there, but they should also have more radically left-wing voices on there. They genuinely don't. You know, our idea of what constitutes a radical leftist in this country is like the Labour left. And that's ridiculous, right? Like they should be, we should, you should, on the ABC, you should be hearing from anarchists and you should, you should hear from, um, from, yes, even members of the far right. And, you know, like it is possible, I think, for the ABC, the public broadcaster to critique, examine, um, and have those voices on there to have actually lively discussions that represent where people are at. Not in a sensationalist way, mm. but in a way that actually sort of actually gives voice to all the different um, perspectives on the political spectrum. I mean, you know, again, the ABC is often dismissed or tarnished as some hotbed for left left wing <laughs> radicalism. It's just not at all. It, it's a hmm. progressively liberal organization, smaller liberal organization, um, with some basic ideas about. Uh, the role of the state. I mean, it's a public broadcaster. Okay, so if you work for the ABC, you believe in the ABC, you you are intrinsically saying that the government has a role to play somewhat in providing a, a public good, like a public uh, broadcasting. So I think that's sort of just an obvious gimme. But yeah, there should be more conservatives on that. Now, I also appreciate the fact, as I heard a lot when I worked for the ABC, they offer jobs to conservative people and they say, not enough money, fuck you. I'm going <laughs> to, to make you know crazy cash in the corporate media where I can also do the bidding of my... Um, 
billionaire overlords. They're happy to do that. There are lots of examples of the ABC offering or approaching and trying to get more conservative voices on and then being rebuked by the conservatives themselves. So, Yeah. The challenge, I guess, for someone in your position trying to marry um, an authentic um, representation of your identity and politics through your comedy um, is that it's a small country in term in an industrial sense so you talk there about like a left-wing media group that can exist in the uk where you're talking about a market of 80 million people so there's a big enough market for people to uh, make a niche like that work um or america you know over 300 million people all of these different different niches can exist and be profitable but here it's different so that seems to be why a lot of people limit themselves it's like our democratic system you have to play to the middle, yeah. it seems, to have a career that will pay the bills. Yes, I am increasingly fighting this, Tom Tilly, I must say. I mean, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to do some, some jokes about Labour, right? Because cause Labour in government and Labour are, in my view, doing lots of really terrible things, particularly uh, on Israel Gaza at the moment. I mean, I think, I think the amount of the lack of discussion and critique of this Labour government and their position in Gaza is atrocious. And at my shows which broadly are going to be attended by people who broadly agree with me. Uh, I feel like that's a good place for me to get a few jabs in there and talk about how Anthony Albanese is <laughs> not just this good old boy who has a cool nickname and grew up in public housing, right? Like, let's look at what his government's actually doing. Let's make some jokes about that. Um, and it's a struggle, right? And I am, you know, because sometimes I'm sure there's lots of Labour voters who come, who come to see me or broadly progressive people who haven't heard a comedian do lots of jokes from the left about Labour. And uh, I mean, I, I was joking about this on stage the other night. I'm like, I really am shrinking my market. <laughs> this isn't viable <laughs> to to just appeal to 12 percent of the population who vote Greens, right? Um, and and yeah, you can see how that plays out. I mean, a couple of years ago for the gala in 2021, I recorded a set that was a, a very critical rant about the Liberal Party, right? Mm. Um, and that was cut from the the broadcast. The ABC made the editorial decision to not uh, release that set, um, which was frustrating, but entirely within their rights. They did give me the footage and I was able to release it. People can watch it on my YouTube channel if they so wish. Of course, it blew up because the SMH reported about it going out and misquoted me and then Andrew Bolt called me a true barbarian and it was all hmm. much of a very silly fun. But that was just a very interesting example of the ABC saying this comedy routine where I'm expressing my opinion about an explicit political party, not talking about conservatives, but talking about liberals and talking about liberal voters and going pretty hard on them. That was beyond the pale, according to the, the editorial policy. And I, and I think that I am perhaps unique in, in the Australian comedy scene, or there's a few other people who sort of meet this, meet mm. this um, same description, but like I'm, I'm quite partisan and I'm sort of saying these specific people, not just politics in general sucks, but like these specific parties and this political ideology is the thing that I really think is bad and I want to critique and want to go after. Um, I, I think people are maybe not as used to that. You're right. I think mainstream audiences don't necessarily mm. always, it's always, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a shock for them. Um, and whether I'm going to change that to appeal to more people or just stick to my guns <laughs> and play progressively smaller venues, I guess we'll find out. I mean, we got to the point earlier that this is, this is about entertainment. This is comedy. It, it, it might be partially about wanting to change the world, but as we pointed out, there were other things you'd be doing with your life if it really was all about changing the world. But I imagine you'd love it to be part of the ideas discourse. And so speaking to the choir not only presents, preaching to the choir, you know, the small people, amount of people that agree with you <laughs> is economically challenging in Australia, as we just touched on. But I imagine you're not changing anyone's mind in the rooms. These are like not, uh, I guess they're a laugh chamber and an echo chamber. <laughs> um, does that worry you? Did you care? Is it about that? Or, or really when you come back to the, the real reason for it, which is entertainment, that wins out. Again, very interesting question. Someone pointed out to me that the, the, the phrase preaching to the choir is very strange because um, preachers only ever preach to the, the choir and the people in the church. So it's, it's not a good example, right? Like people together get together in a church to listen to a preacher. Presumably, everyone is from the same religion and they're listening to a preacher lay out their ideas. When I hear that phrase, I, am, I imagine, so you've got the, the main audience and the choir. And so the choir might be off to the side. And I take it to mean that the 
the choir are the most enthusiastic members of that church. So I he's see. kind of turning and preaching to the the real enthusiasts, right. you know, even more so than the people who who also spend their time just to sit in the pews. Interesting. That's how I see it. Yeah, that is that is probably pretty good. But we can all agree that everyone in that church is probably broadly on board the whole religion sort of thing, right? You're not going to find, if it's a Catholic church, there mm. aren't going to be a whole bunch of Muslims in there that the preacher then has to try and convert <laughs> through an incredible through an incredible address mm. necessarily. But I take your point. Um, no, I mean, the, the idea of changing people's minds through comedy, I think is pretty, in, in a serious way, like seriously, you know, get Corey Bernardi into my audience or get someone from the Liberal Party um, in the audience as if they're going to um, I mean, I've had liberals come to my my show and they say, yeah, hey, I think you're funny. I don't agree with you, but it's funny. It's all good. It's, that's all fine. But the idea mm. that, yes, the comedy routine is the thing that's going to seriously um, massively shift someone's political worldview or political priorities is is um, for the birds, in my, in my view. Left-wing progressive comedy can, I think, play an important role in building solidarity. I mean, I've gone to see comedians that I really love and they just reminded me that I'm not crazy, right? Hmm. Reminded me that the people in power are idiots and <laughs> reminded me of the good things to value in life. And when you land a really great satirical line and you just you just point out and get to the root of an injustice in society about the way we treat refugees, about our priorities, about how the rich get away with everything and we spend all our time blaming immigrants and the poor for our problems. Like if someone can just deliver a line that blows that bullshit up, something that you probably already knew or thought of before, to be reminded of that through an art, through a great piece of art, like that can be a real, uh, real pick-me-up, right? It can really build solidarity, I think, and really, really, um, yeah, a little morale boost for the movement, mm. right? Now, yes, I'm I'm doing this under capitalism, so I'm selling tickets for this. I'm making money. I'm trying to make my living of doing this. I also have an ego and I have <laughs> self-esteem issues, so I need validation from strangers. <laughs> All that's mixed in there. But in the process of making that art, if I can reach out to other people and connect on something that we all that we can in that room at least generally agree on, or even if you don't agree with me, you can see why I think what I do. You know, I, th I think often people don't give audiences credit. Audiences can see someone say something on stage that they do not agree with and still find it funny and still appreciate the insight into that person's view. I think that's totally fine. Um, yeah, I just still think that's that's really valuable. Um, no, I'm not changing the world, but I'm making art, I'm expressing it, and that can connect with lots and lots of different people in a, in a, in a meaningful way. Um, mm. the, the, there is far too much pressure on political comedy to to be a salve and to seriously change the discourse. I just don't think that's that's how it works necessarily. Now, comedy can expose people to some new ideas. I think you look at someone like George Carlin and you think the number of people who he would have challenged them to think about issues in a slightly different way. I think that's certainly true over the course of his very long career as he performed, you know, heaps of specials to hundreds of thousands of people, reaching millions of people really through his through his televised specials. You'd have to say that pushes the needle a little bit. Someone like Chris mm. Rock or Dave Chappelle's early stuff talking about race <laughs> relations in politics. Um, you know, that really does make the difference. Um, so yeah, at the margins, perhaps a little bit, but I'm I'm certainly not in that category. And if I can put on a show that speaks to other young people, other progressive people around Australia or other human beings generally and speak to the moment, then I think that's that's good in and of itself, even if it doesn't, mm. you know, result in membership of the Greens increasing or what have you. Another really interesting example in this space, um, or I guess the space we're talking about of, of making a political point, but also um, in connection with your work using anger in comedy is Hannah Gadsby. And they were, mm. you know you've kind of come through the same comedy channels, you were kicking around the same scenes and what was it like for you observing their story? I was only filled with happiness for them. <laughs> <laughs> Pure jealousy. No, no, of course, no, sincerely. <laughs> of course. I, if any comedian says they're not jealous of Hannah Gatsby's success, even a tiny little bit, I reckon they're, they're probably lying, but they are an amazing comedian. So yes, uh, Hannah and I were in um, Raw Comedy together in 2006. Mm. It's a big open mic competition that um, that uh, Triple J supports that's run at the festival. Celia Bacola was in that year as well. My friend Michael Williams, Ben Jenkins, a whole bunch of awesome people have gone on to, to really great work. Um, Hannah was the absolute, uh, you know, uh, hands down standout and has always been a brilliant comedian, brilliant storytelling comedian. And then I remember what it was 2006 to 2016, 2017 maybe mm. is when 
I remember we were being in Adelaide together at the same time. We, were, we got an airport uh, lift back to the airport together when we were leaving Adelaide when they were doing this Nanette show and they were saying, look, this is it. I'm walking away from comedy. I'm, I'm going out. People are not receiving this show very well. It's going kind of weird or some people are loving it and other people are hating it, sort of talking through this process. And that show obviously becomes Nanette and becomes a worldwide phenomenon. A show that was burning with anger with both their experience as of, of sexual violence, but also a critique of comedy itself, right? This mm. idea that telling jokes about this dark shit in their life uh, undermines the critique or lessens the seriousness of those of those issues, right? So I think that's what's really challenging about Nanette to other comedians and particularly ones that talk about social is- issues. You know, we love to tell ourselves telling jokes about stuff uh, makes the world better and actually helps you deal with things and move on. Hannah's actually saying, no, I think these punchlines that we're uh, forced to come up with um, you know, suck, uh, lessen them in some way or, or our focus on trying to get a laugh out of these things when they're not funny is, is actually a problem, which was pretty, pretty wild. Yeah. That was the like deep gut punch of the show was that, um, turning these experiences into a joke lets people off the hook, people who are responsible even for, um, creating these experiences or, or harming people. And so, this show tonight will not be funny. I'm going to hold you in this tension and this pain of the way the way people are are treated. So, what what did you learn from that? Because we've been we've been dancing around these themes about how serious comedy should be, how political you can be, um, whether you're really trying to change anyone's mind in that room, or whether it's about um, you know galvanizing galvanizing people about their beliefs. What did what did you sort of learn from that experience of of Hannah's show blowing up and how you can sort of pull these levers or lean into these elements of your work? Yeah, it was really interesting. I've thought about it a lot, and I would have to say that there's probably some elements of this of this critique or ideology that I I disagree with. I mean, just reflecting on my own experience, when I write a joke about my, my body being a little bit fat, when I've made jokes about my sexuality, when I've made jokes about things about myself that I don't really like, I have found that to be an empowering experience and I've been able to own that thing about me. And the idea of taking something that I don't like about myself and getting a room full of people to laugh about that thing, I've loved. That's actually made me feel better about the thing that I don't like about myself. Now, I'm not equating mm-hmm. my chubbiness to the experience of being the victim of sexual of violence or the kind of... Um, you know, misogynist abuse and critiques that Hannah would have experienced over the course of their life, being a public figure and being a queer person and um, being, you know, having having the body that she does, uh, which, which, sorry, having the body which they do. So I don't want to equate those two things, but uh, but I would quibble a little bit on that on that front. But in terms of Hannah dragging the concept of a comedy show into a bigger cultural conversation and sort of saying that, you know just because I'm up here doing comedy doesn't mean that I can't talk about really dark stuff or just because I'm a comedian doesn't mean that every now and again I'm going to say something really serious and what I really think and just because the nature of a stand-up comedy geek exists doesn't mean that rape and horrible things aren't happening out in the real world all the time. Um, I think that's extremely powerful and, and really vital, yes. I mean, Nanette just kind of blew up the whole idea about what stand-up can or can't be about Mm. and i think the response you got particularly from let's be honest american male comedians which is like this isn't comedy this is a one-person show you know stand this is not what stand-up is about was just like they just seemed ridiculous to me because it's like this this is one of the freest art forms in the world and you can draw lines about what you can and can't say and i actually think from a australian or british perspective in which comedy and theater the, the the lines between comedy and theater are so much more blurred as they are as opposed to how they are in america you know we sort of got it a lot a lot um, e- more easily particularly in the uk you know the relationship between theater and stand up a one person show is kind of what you're doing every single year at the edinburgh fringe you know with theatrical elements there might be a moment when you're you know revealing a truth there's no joke but you're just saying something really real um, all of that is much more free and, and open to interpretation. I think that's probably a better way to think about it, right? It was it was a theatrical show that used that drew on the history of stand up comedy and elements of stand up comedy, and ultimately 
as all these freedom of speech motherfuckers should agree with, you should be able to say whatever the hell you want and, and take audiences wherever you want to go. It's totally fine. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I've always thought the the genre of stand-up comedy didn't make sense or was too limited. And I always actually, I've always found it a bit of a strange medium, but to hear there's a bit of a split between what, I've never actually heard it described in this way as the, the one person show being uh, almost a separate discipline or or, or style or, or medium or performance to, to stand-up comedy. So I, yeah, you're talking about shows that have a lot more production or, or are more around storytelling than than just your classic gag yeah or like yeah shows that have a director shows that might end up on broadway i mean shows like alex edelman's this is us or Jacqueline novak's get on your knees which has just been released as a netflix stand-up comedy special but is a 90 minute one woman show with heaps of jokes that uses the stand-up comedy concept but as a director and is trying to say something as well again it can be considered stand-up comedy it can be considered theater it's just that there are some old school road comic american uh, dudes mainly who are like comedy in a comedy club you should just be as funny as humanly possible for 45 minutes no one's going to learn anything no one's going to feel anything it's just jokes <laughs> jokes jokes and then get the fuck off right and that's that's some people's view and if that's for the kind of comedy you want to do that's totally fine i just find it very silly when comedians get so precious and say had a gadby's breaking the rules or something or that's not you're not allowed to do it that way it's just i just think you seem mm. very very silly you know Hannah Gadsby created a show that spoke to millions of people across the world. And mm. there were a whole bunch of jokes in it. There was a bunch of serious stuff in it. There was theater. There was stand-up comedy. Who cares? It was, it was, it was art. And you can not like the show if you so wish. But the idea that there are rules mm. that must be uh, adhered to, I just think, is, yeah, it gets very silly to me. Well, you've been breaking them for a long time. And there are no signs of you stopping and... <laughs> Apart from um, probably destroying you with jealousy, it sounds like that was pretty affirming for what for what you've been doing. Um, I think that's a great place to end it, Tom. I've I've really enjoyed being able to unpack some of this stuff because I've been I've been watching your journey for since probably two thousand and eight. Wow, we're old. <laughs> we are old, which is very annoying. But um, it's been delightful <laughs> talking to you, Tom and Telly. And I hope that was all that ranting made some kind of sense and was incredibly insightful and powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I've completely. I'm now voting for the Greens. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Happy to know. Yes, I got them. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. Don't even tell my mum who I vote for. I'm. I'm still sticking with the ABC impartiality. <laughs> oh God. Despite having left a while ago. <laughs> no uh, some people know some people don't um, Tom thank you so much thanks Tom cheers mate hey that was another episode of the weekend briefing I really hope you liked it if you did um, please um, like this video drop us a comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more of these big interviews with the humans behind the headlines <laughs>